Um, we're going to go into a small session um, of testimonies. Um, just for security reasons, we have other people relaying the testimonies, such as the fear of the women in Tigray who have given the testimonies. So please bear with us um, as these testimonies, we will have three. And uh, if I can ask the first person on testimony one to start, please. Okay, thank you so much. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. A video is obtained of a victim of rape. The video is heartbreaking and sickening story of a woman who is raped and physically attacked by a group of air trans soldiers. The story is as follows. The air trans soldiers took a group of women to a remote place to their military camp, somewhere out of Abigrat. She estimates the number of women who are taken by force to their camp, like the number of women in a minibus, full of women in a minibus. She was raped by a group of five air trans soldiers, and it was a gang rape three times. She heard the name of the soldiers, the rapists, and they call to each other. Two of them are called Awad and Muhammad. She said, the soldiers who raped her are from the plain tribe of Eritrea. They have the scars on their face, around to their cheeks. First, she came to Adgrat Hospital, but she was referred to Ma'ala. On her way to Ma'ala, Accompanied by the soldiers who had raped her, the soldiers abused and raped her again. This time, she doesn't remember how many soldiers and how many times she was raped. The woman says there was a woman who gave birth recently and was raped. She was among the women who were taken to the camp. What's so sickening about the story of this woman is her recently newborn baby is killed brutally. The soldiers say Her 12 years old son was killed in front of her, and she was worried her dead son is eaten by hyenas or wild animals. This imagination and the death of her son has disturbed her unimaginably. From her story and her explanation, the death of her son made her mentally unstable. The survivor said the rapists were taking pictures while they were raping her, and they strictly warned her to say she's raped by Ethiopian soldiers, if in case she's asked. If they knew she said she's raped by Eritrean soldiers or Shabia, they will find and kill her. The victim was so hungry, and when she found something to eat in, tried to eat, she realized that her teeth were broken and lost. In the video, she saw her tooth, her lost tooth and the injury she has because of the physical abuse in she had. She was raped, physically abused and violated. Their trans soldiers took her jewelry as well. She said they took all her gold jewelry. And when she came to Ma'ala for a treatment and reached around Abla, the soldiers injected her and she became unconscious. And so it's not clear from the story. It seems 
that I have to throw her out somewhere between Agula and Maala. And a Red Cross ambulance took her to either hospital. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Maybe you can continue, please, with the next. Yes, um, this is the second testimony. It's a collected testimony by a solidarity group in Tichai. A doctor in the city of Adichrat reported that one woman had been left on the side of the road after she had been raped by over 20 Eritrean soldiers. When she received medical care, surgeons had to remove stones and nails that had been inserted inside her genitals. A video was circulated. A 27-year-old woman had been kidnapped by five Eritrean soldiers and subjected to severe sexual violence for over two weeks. During the captivity, she was repeatedly gang-raped by Eritrean forces, sometimes 15 soldiers for over eight hours at a time. The ordeal left her with a fractured spine and pelvis. One woman lost her ability to move her legs and control her bladder after being raped by three Eritrean soldiers and two Ethiopian soldiers. In the town of Abi Adi, a teenager lost her right hand after being raped by an alleged Eritrean soldier wearing an Ethiopian military uniform. The soldier initially tried to force the schoolgirl's grandfather to have sex with the teenager, but when he was not successful, he shot the grandfather. In the town of Wukro, a husband was forced by gunpoint to watch his wife being raped by four Eritrean soldiers. In Western Tihai, Eritrean soldiers pulled aside 20 women and raped them. The following day, only 13 returned. Eritrean soldiers told them to go, saying, we already have what we want. This is uh, reported by the Telegraph. Selam, a 26-year-old coffee seller in Edaga Hamus, 100 kilometers away from uh, Tichai's capital of Megela, said she was abducted by Eritrean soldiers with 17 other women in January. They took us into the forest. When we arrived there, there were around 100 soldiers who were waiting for us. They tied the hands and, they tied the hands and feet of each one of us, and then they raped us without mercy she told the Telegraph as she fought through tears. We stayed that way for three days. After three days, the soldiers killed five girls who had been tied with us. They pulled, al pulled alcohol over our wounds. They danced standing over us. By the time she was taken into the forest, she had already been raped several times by men she recognized as Eritrean soldiers. After the first attack, her abusers were waiting for her as she returned to, the ha to her house from the hospital with contraceptives and post-exposure HIV drugs. Why the hell did you, uh, did you want this? We want you to be sick. That is what we are here for. We are here to make you HIV positive, Salam recalled one of the men are saying. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much. And maybe we'll go to testimony three, please. Okay, so we have about six cases. I'll just start with the first one. Okay. Azada fled from the town of Froeni with her family to the mountains with no food or water. After a week, she came to a deserted town. Assuming there was no soldiers, she walked to her house. Little did she know she was being followed by two soldiers. They followed her into her house and told her to take off her clothes or else. They threatened to kill her and burn the house along with her body if she didn't compile. Compli At this, as this was taking place, her neighbor, Leta Brahan, walks into the house to hear this conversation. Leta Brahan overhears the conversation and immediately starts to beg the soldiers to stop what they're doing. She tells them Atada is underage. The soldiers ignore Letabrahan and tell Azada to lay down on the bed and take off her clothes as well. Letabrahan, finally hopeless and desperate that she won't be able to get their attention, asks them to rape her instead. She was finally able to get their attention. 
They turned around and looked at Little Brahan, considering her proposition. The soldiers agreed to rape Little Brahan instead for hours, one after the other. As Ada says, Little Brahan didn't leave her room for over a week. She covered her face and body. She didn't speak to anyone. She didn't seek medical care, not that any was available. She remains in her room, crying day and night. As Ada couldn't bear the guilt of what happened to Little Brahan, she holds herself accountable. She cries talking about what happened, and she calls it her misfortune. As Ada finally couldn't bear that what had happened and runs away to Mo'ale, the capital of Tigray. As Ada, a child, carries the guilt for a crime she neither perpetrated nor had the power to stop. Tigray is now soaked with stories like As Ada, stories of terror, sexual abuse, massacres, destruction, and hate to an unimaginable degree. Case two, Lemlem is from Samama in south of Aksum. She now lives in one of the many makeshift camps built in for IDPs in Aksum. She speaks in agony about what happened to her four months back in January of this year. Like many of the raids undertaken by the Ethiopian and Eritrean soldiers in her small town, this too would quickly turn into a hor horror show for its residents. This time, Eritrean soldiers had started shooting at civilians and three came into her house and locked her inside. Noticing that her husband, has, her husband wasn't present, they asked her if, she, if her husband is fighting against them, along with Wayane, or to be a left. Lemlem's husband and father of her children had to run to the mountains to avoid military raids as they often turn into murder scene for men. They could not have quite imagined what might unfold. She said he was not. One of the soldiers then asked that she take off her clothes. Lem Lem lied and said she was pregnant, assuming they would have mercy for her. Without a second thought, the soldier said, that's good, let's remove the junta inside you and replace it with our own race. Two of them opened her legs forcefully and the other brought a rough stick and inserted it into her vaginal canal and steered it with the intention of aborting her pregnancy. After the Eritrean men removed the stick, they took their turn raping her as she screamed in pain. She doesn't really know for how long this was taking place. It may have been minutes or maybe hours, but it felt like it had been forever. They finally left. She ran off to the bushes to avoid ever having to see them again. For two months, Lemlem couldn't control her urine, continuous abdominal pain, and vaginal discharge. She's unable to fully communicate even with her family members. She cries most of the day. The health facility in her town has been destroyed by the Eritrean troops. It may have been minutes, maybe hours. It couldn't have been days, but it's also a lifetime in a way. Case three. Zimam is a 70 years old nun with mental illness. She had lived all her life in the monastery. One day she was wandering in her church as she always does when the Ethiopian soldiers arrived, kidnapped her and kept her for three days in one room. On the fourth day, they brought her back and left her near the monastery. She was confused, disturbed, suspicious, and silently cried. She only talks to one nun, otherwise kept to herself. Since then, she avoids going to churches and prayers, saying, I am not allowed to go in there anymore. When she came to the hospital, she was told that she has STD. Case 4. One of the survivors was 22 years old. She used to live in Himara. In November, when the war started, she was separated from her, from her husband, whom she married five months earlier to the war. They found her while she was running for her life, and she was pregnant of two months and was raped by three Eritrean soldiers. The next day, she started bleeding, and she had a miscarriage, but still it took her three days to go to the hospital to get medical help. She then came to Magale. She has developed PTSD. After three months of waiting, she was told that her husband was killed by the Amhara force, and she went back to her home for her funeral, for his funeral. And then again, Eritrean soldiers took her and other three women from the bus and kept her for four days. Case five. Two survivors from around Uro 
aged 67 and 75. They've been neighbors for 25 years. On March 1st evening, two Air Train soldiers came to Wizero to her house and forcefully started taking her clothes. At this time, she started to shout and ask for help. After hearing the loud shout, Wizero Medhin came to provide help. Thinking what has happened to her neighbor, she went there. She, had, she was pulled inside the house and both of them were raped at the same time. When they came to the hospital, both of them were ashamed and worried about the social stigma they have to face for the rest of their life. Case six. Gannett is a 39 years old woman from Tigray, who was fleeing her hometown with two other women and three children to escape the war. They were then stopped by five Eritrean soldiers and taken to their camps and questions to the whereabouts of their husbands. The husbands of the two women, including Gannett, are part of the Tigray Defense Force. The third woman exposed them to the soldiers in hopes they would leave her. But the air train soldiers took turns raping the three women for four hours. After that, one of the soldiers pulled out a metal from his clashing and put it on fire and then insert, inserted it into her uterus. He then said, now you'll never give birth to a baby of Junta. She then passed out. As she would find out later, they put small pieces of metals inside of her. They were held there for 24 hours and released onto the streets. She then joined IDP shelter, shelter and there she started to have complications. She couldn't walk, sit, or control her urine. It was at this time she decided to give her children up and commit suicide. She talked to one of the aid workers there. They brought her to the hospital. They did an ultrasound and could see the metals lodged inside her uterus. She then had surgery and the metals were extracted. She still hasn't healed fully. She limps and is unable to sit. She still lives in fear that they will come to take her. A while ago, she heard that some of the soldiers are coming towards where she is and she ran into the bushes limping with pain with her kids but came back later when they left the place. She said she doesn't want to cry in front of people. She wants to be strong and when the time comes, be an example and advocate for women's rights. She then asked, will I ever be able to live without my past holding me back without people seeing me as a victim? Our conclusion, what's happening in Tigray is devastating. Public service, telecommunication, electricity, water, banks, health facilities, schools, Essential service providers that can reduce the plight of women have been primary targets of occupying forces. Police justice systems, health facilities cannot investigate perpetrators of sexual violence. The number we have of GBV victims is clearly the tip of the iceberg. The number of women that report rape looking to terminate a pregnancy are much higher and above those that report rape because it's a crime. Weaponized rape and sexual slavery have made Tigray a living hell for women. Not only are women and girls being sexually abused, these abuses are followed by other acts of cruelty. It has become common to hear about hospitals being occupied with women that have foreign bodies like stones, sand, metals inside their uterus in hopes of making women of Tigray and Fertile. These acts and verbal confirmation of the intention of the acts by perpetrators are signs of genocide. A total war has been launched on the people of Tigray. Unarmed men have been taken out of their homes, shot and killed. Women raped with intention to, quote, purify their blood. Hospitals looted and destroyed. Occupying forces have demonstrated once again that words like never again mean nothing and actions have no consequences. Thank you. Thank you so much. I just thank all the women who gave us those testimonies um, and for their bravery uh, to relate them to us. It's very, very difficult. Uh, now, so could we go to uh, Selam? Yes, we could. My lovely, thank you very much. Um, I'm trying to um, open my um, cam, but it, it's not responding. So if, uh, hold on. 
we've got uh, we've got your picture anyway so <laughs> okay so it, it, yeah I'll, I'll, I'll get started um my name is Salam Kidani. I'm an Eritrean psychotherapist born and mostly raised in Ethiopia. I have spent many years worrying and advocating for the rights of Eritreans inside the country and fellow refugees too. As a researcher into traumatic stress and collective trauma, I spent several years traveling back and forth to um, Tigray. And this gave me an opportunity to get to know the, the region and understand the people of Tigray really well. A refined people who try hard not to offend you while they are not afraid to tell you what they think. I have received the blessing of many elders, found kindred spirit in many women in the villages, as well as had opportunity to, to, for, of an in-depth discussion with academics and politicians. I re it really makes me sad. Um, to hear what we've just been hearing. It is harrowing to hear that it's happening to the people of Tigray who are accommodated as Eritrean refugees and treated us as their own, despite the political standoff for two decades. It is particularly gut-wrenching to realize that it's happening at the hand of Eritrean soldiers, who to all intents and purposes are victims of the very regime that is deploying them. Many would have been captured from, this, from the streets of their towns and villages and forcefully drafted into the National Service Army, which has effectively become an indefinite bondage of slavery. The Eritrean National Service, at the Eritrean National Service, the men and women are kept there for years with no education, no access to credible information, and under the constant bombardment of hateful propaganda and indoctrination into the hateful policies that we have been witnessing in Tigray for the last six months. The result is devastated citizen. I don't feel safe in Tigray anymore. Even the sight of the military uniform uniform frightens me very much. Terhas, not her real name, told AFP during a tearful inter interview in March. She's one of thousands of women who had faced heinous sadism, sadistic experiences of gang rapes. Rapes in front of members of family, incestuous sexual violence forced at gun points, and nails and other objects being inserted into women. It makes me shudder even listening, listing this. I hear that Tarhas is clearly I hear that Tarhas is clearly traumatized, and so are the rest of us upon hearing this. During my research among Eritrean refugees, I had come across Eritrean women who were violated in similar ways in Sinai, where they were trafficked uh, for ransom. Eritrean women there were captured, relatives or other Eritreans forced, forced were forced to rape them. Their genitals were burnt. Many things were also uh, we also hear happening in Tigray happen there. Eritrean women face constant sexual harassment at the military training centers in Eritrea too. The extent might, might not be comparable, but the devastative effect of this barbar barbarity to the women and their communities will not be different. I have witnessed the situation inside Eritrea and, ex uh, and the experiences of Eritreans along the human trafficking routes has done to, has done to Eritreans across the globe. And in Tigray, it is the same and perhaps a thousand times worse. Here we have a, the sadistic and system, system, systematic violation under war condition as a way of subjugating an entire population and, popula and possibly across generations too. To make matters worse, the, response so far are, the responses so far are deaf ears for six relentless months. If this situation is an indictment against the criminals committing these crimes, it is certainly is also an indictment against their leaders who have created a situation which is in which this can happen with impunity and a world that it that is slow to hear the plight of survivors and even slower to protect them the root of much of 
The plight in Tigray is inside Eritrea, where the government perpetrates heinous crimes against humanity that were investigated by the UN Human Rights Commission in, to, in 2016. It qualified as it qualified the indefinite national service that affects all Eritreans as a crime against humanity. National service is slavery in Eritrea. It is now deployed outside the borders in foreign land, committing heinous crimes. Similarly to the silence now in Tigray, by 2018, the world completely bypassed the plight of Eritreans and let Isa Saforki totally off the hook. By 2021, he escalated his sadism to his, uh, the sadism of his crime to double his victims and include the entire people of Tigray in addition to the people of Eritrea. The crime against humanity that Isa Saforki is responsible for should no longer be ignored or overlooked. We have international mechanisms devised for justice purposes, and it is imperative that we that they are used to contain the evil and protect victims. Isa Saforki should be referred to the ICC without delay to count uh, to account for his crimes against humanity committed against Grians and Eritreans. Only ending this cycle of impunity will stop the cycle of devastation across the Horn of Africa. Thank you. Thank you so much for uh, Salen for that, that uh, very comprehensive uh, picture that you paint and you understand the emotion that you that you have it will be a big part of that. Thank you so much. Uh, our next speaker, uh, Gosia, um, is, is very well known across Europe for her work um, for women. Uh, she, in a previous time, was an MEP as well in politics, so she's worked in politics, but is known right across the NGO spectrum in Europe as an activist. And uh, Gosia, thank you so much for being here, and uh, I give you the floor. Uh, thank you, uh, Paddy. Uh, I'm deeply honored to be uh, able to participate in this uh, uh, webinar uh, and uh, share my experience from my work in Amnesty International and uh, women's organizations when uh, the International Criminal Court was established. And I was uh, lobbying that gender-based crimes like rape and forced pregnancy would be included in the statue of the court. And now I hearing to uh, all what was said today, I can see that uh, how important it is that uh, the perpetrators will stand uh, in front of the International Criminal uh, Court and uh, face uh, justice for the terrible crimes that were uh, committed. Legally, uh, rape was recognized as a war crime relatively recently in the second half of the 20th century. At that time, cases of rape were document, documented in more than 20 conflicts. The most known cases included at the, uh, at the time were rapes committed on a mass scale in the 1990s, when rape was used as an instrument of ethnic cleansing in the former Yugoslavia, and as a means of genocide in Rwanda. In the former case, women belonging to the enemy nation were intentionally impregnated through rape by soldiers and they were kept imprisoned uh, sometimes uh, as, until they gave birth to the child of the enemy. Rape was an instrument to humiliate and terrorize and uh, make people leave their homes. In the latter case, women belonging to the Tutsi ethnic group were systematically raped by HIV-infected men, recruited and organized by the Hutu-led government. Because of the huge scale of rape in the Balkan and Rwandan conflicts, the international institutions and community began to recognize rape as a weapon and strategy of war. The existing, existing laws were used to prosecute those cases of rape, but a clear need for new legislation became obvious. 
Article 27 of the Geneva Convention relative to the protection of civilian persons in time of war, coming from 1949, included language protecting women against any attack on their honor, in particular against rape and forced prostitution or any form of indecent assault. This protection was later extended in an additional protocol adapted in 1977. In 1993, the United Nations Commission on Human Rights declared systematic rape and military sexual slavery to be crimes against humanity punishable as violations of women's human rights. In 1995, the UN Fourth World Conference on Women in Beijing explicitly declared that rape by armed groups during wartime is a war, war crime. The jurisdiction of the international tribunals established to prosecute crimes committed in the conflicts in the former Yugoslavia and Rwanda included rape as a war crime. Hence, these tribunals were the first international bodies to prosecute sexual violence as a war crime. In 1998, uh, the Rwanda Tribunal ruled that rape and sexual violence constitute genocide. The statute of the International Criminal Court established in 1998 declared rape and forced pregnancy as war crimes. In a resolution adopted in 2008, the UN Security Council affirmed that rape and other forms of sexual violence can constitute war crimes, crimes against humanity, or a const constitutive act with respect to genocide. The International Criminal Court first ruling and conviction for rape as a war crime was made in the case of former Congolese Vice President Jean-Pierre Bemba in 2018. The case was the first before the ICC to focus on sexual violence as a weapon of war, as well as on a senior military official whose forces carried out the atrocities, even if he himself not directly ordered them to do so. The ICC found him guilty on five charges of crimes against humanity and war crimes, including rape, committed in 2002-2003 in Central African Republic. More than 5,000 victims participated in the proceedings. It is important to look for support and knowledge in coalitions like Women's Initiative for Gender Justice. It is an international women's human rights organization that advocates for gender justice through the International Criminal Court and through domestic mechanisms, including peace negotiations and justice processes. At the moment, this organization is supporting victims from Uganda, Libya, Congo, Central African Republic and Darfur. But I think it's very urgent that we make them work on uh, the situation in, uh, of women in Tigray as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much, Gashia. Thank you so much for that.